The Community Healthcare Access Program, CHAP, and UWM Norse Health Center are available to connect City of Milwaukee residents to the right insurance plan. For questions or assistance with enrollment in state programs such as Badger Care and Food Share or federal enrollment in the marketplace, call the City of Milwaukee Health Department Community Healthcare Access Program at 414-286-8620 or schedule your virtual one-on-one -on -one appointment online. Visit the Milwaukee Health Department's Facebook page for more information on these free virtual visits or virtual services. Thank you. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Weston. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon. First to our numbers. We're currently seeing in Milwaukee County an average of 151 new cases per day and about two deaths per day. We continue to see downtrends in cases, in positivity, and in hospitalizations. And we also see low rates of initial vaccination, only about 400 new first doses per day. Now, despite these promising trends in disease burden, we don't know what the winter will bring. We do know that the best way to protect yourself and your community from whatever is to come is to get vaccinated. Well, this promises to be a big week with the likely green light to begin vaccinating five to 11 year olds against COVID. Now there are many parents, myself included, who cannot wait to get their child vaccinated. In fact, every physician that I've talked to with kids in this age group wants to be first in line to get their child protected. And with good reason. We've seen over 5 million children infected with COVID in our country and 791 deaths. COVID has consistently been one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States for children. And even if your child is lucky enough to not have serious short-term illness from COVID, long-term effects are common, including trouble concentrating, shortness of breath, and fatigue. We're now on the precipice of all this, the cases, the hospitalizations, the deaths, and the long-term effects being preventable with a simple, safe, and proven vaccine. And that's we, why we cannot wait to get our children vaccinated. But it's also to protect our community. Kids do not live in isolation. They are consistently exposed to teachers, to family members, and to neighbors. Remember that even a fully vaccinated 80-year-old has a higher risk of dying from COVID than an unvaccinated 40-year-old. That is to say, we must continue to protect our elderly and our vulnerable populations beyond just individual vaccination. We must think about community vaccination. Gathering around the holiday table with vaccinated children will still help to protect fully vaccinated grandparents. So with that in mind, how can we prepare our children for the vaccine? Start the conversation now to prepare your child. Talk about the experience. Where will they go? What will happen? But also talk about why. Explain that they're part of the fight against COVID. Share with them that by them getting the shot, they'll be protecting their grandparents and their loved ones. Talk to them about what they'll be able to do once they're fully vaccinated, whether that means no longer having to be away from school as much for quarantines or getting to join trips to the grocery store, or getting to have more play dates. Kids this age understand much more than we tend to give them credit. They've paid a price as well during this pandemic, and they're excited to move forward. So engage them in the process and in the understanding of their notable contribution. So in the coming days, we'll see guidance, clear guidance from the CDC on vaccinating five to 11 year olds. We'll also see more information about where you can get your child vaccinated. Many local health departments, pharmacies, and primary care clinics are already offering appointments in the future for the vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds. So check their websites for more details, and also keep an eye on healthymke.com for up-to-date information on the safety and efficacy of the childhood vaccine, as well as locations for vaccination clinics. Thank you very much. Stay safe, and I'll hand it to Health Officer Rausch. Thank you very much, Dr. Weston. It's my pleasure to join today to talk a little bit about the data that we're seeing with COVID-19 cases in our community. I'll start today by just sharing a couple graphs and kind of talking through those because they kind of set the tone with where, what, where we're seeing the data heading and what we anticipate is going to happen in the coming weeks. So first, I just want to point out that this data is from last week, and so there'll be some new data available this week, Thursday. But what we've been seeing for a couple weeks now is sustained decreases across the county. But what's really interesting is we're seeing a more significant in decrease 
Um, with City of Milwaukee residents as a whole, if we look at the seven day averages trending down here, when as compared to the suburban communities. So the suburban communities have been largely flat since early September. Um, the city of Milwaukee has had a spike and has been coming down. And largely this decrease is, is being driven by cases in kids. So as we flip the figure here to look at kids 18 years of age and younger, we see a huge spike in mid-September in the city of Milwaukee children and a very sizable decrease. And in the suburban communities, the spike was much less significant, has a little bit of fluctuation. And now in recent weeks, we've plateaued at a lower level. What I wanna to continue to point out to everybody is that kids still continue to be almost a third, this week it's just a little bit over a third of all cases countywide. So kids still remain a significant proportion. And as Dr. Weston said, we may have word on vaccination for five to 11 year olds, but currently the data only reflects that 12 years of age and older are able to get the vaccine. So we wanna to continue to impart the news and, and the information that mitigation strategies are still important. So we're still seeing in both the kid figure here and in the older adult, we're, we're plateauing, if you will, at a higher level than we had been. And really the levels we're at now are comparable to what we saw between October of 2020 and January of 2020. Obviously that spike went larger as we see here, but this still reflects that we're at a higher level of incidence of disease and we need to continue those mitigation strategies. One other important thing I wanna mention is that while we might have word of a vaccine for kids yet this week, we have to be cognizant of the fact that kids aren't going to get that vaccine just with the snap of the fingers. It will take some time to get our kids, five to 11 year olds, vaccinated. And the data we reflect when we look at the 12 to 15 year olds is that that vaccine was approved on May 12th. And within the first month, we got about 25% of that age group vaccinated. So that was very, very good news. Over the last four months, it has gotten us from 25% to 50% vaccinated with at least one dose. So we know we're going to get to high levels of vaccination. We certainly want to see those numbers very high, but it's gonna take us a while to get there. So in all settings, schools, in the community, there are still going to be mitigation strategies that we should continue to put in place. And with that, I just wanted to highlight a couple research studies that have been published recently by the CDC that really stress the importance of these ongoing mitigation strategies, especially for our children in school settings. And the first is a research study that looked at 999 schools in Maricopa and Pima counties in Arizona. And if you're not familiar with Arizona geography, these are the counties that incorporate both Phoenix and Tucson respectively. And the researchers looked at the prevalence of outbreaks by mask requirements, and they found 191 school associated COVID outbreaks during that time period. And this was the very first month and a half of school for this academic year. They found 59% of the schools without a mask requirement had outbreaks as compared to 8% of schools with a mask requirement. And so the conclusion they made is that given the high transmissibility of the Delta variant, universal masking in addition to vaccination of eligible staff, family members, faculty, and all of the other prevention measures, those layers of Swiss cheese that we've talked about before, remains essential to prevent COVID in the school setting. In another study, researchers looked at 520 counties that either had mask requirements for all schools or no mask requirements at all. And this study looked at rates of COVID and looked to try to account for differences in rates of COVID by looking at other covariates and other factors, including age, race, ethnicity, kid vaccination rates, um, community transmission, population density, social vulnerability, percent uninsured, and percent living in poverty. And in this study, the conclusion was very similar. It basically pointed out that increases in pediatric or kid COVID-19 case rates 
during the start of the school year were smaller in counties with mask requirements than in those without mask requirements. And they further went on to stress the same levels and layers of mitigation that we've talked about before and that they're critical to reducing the spread of COVID-19 in schools. And so the real reason I wanted to share those research studies is to continue to point out that mitigation in COVID over the last 19 months and counting has never been a light switch. It has always been a dimmer switch. And we can slowly turn back that dial in time as other mitigation efforts take hold. So as vaccination takes hold for five to 11 year olds, I would envision we'll be able to turn back the dial on some of those school mitigation uh, strategies. But for now, we need to continue to remain steadfast in all of those mitigation measures, both in schools and other community settings. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll now turn it over to Catherine to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Director Rausch. We'll now hear from Magda Fisahaya with the City of Milwaukee. Good afternoon, everyone. Magda Fisahaya, I'm the Director for the City of Milwaukee's Department of Employer Relations. I wanted to speak to you all about our updates related to our vaccination rates for general city employees. Uh, as you all know, we announced back in August a uh, COVID vaccination policy for general city employees, and it was made effective September 1st. As an employer, we have an obligation to provide a safe workspace for our employees and to keep those in which we serve safe, as well as being a example to the community at large and to the business community in Milwaukee. Uh, we are very proud of our staff for understanding the gravity of this pandemic and their role as leaders in the Milwaukee community. So I am happy to announce that as of today, we have 95.59% compliance with the COVID-19 vaccination policy, which means that, uh, that those numbers are comprised of individuals who uploaded their vaccination documentation or received an approved accommodation request. We are very thankful of our city employees for working day in and day out throughout the pandemic and again, serving as leaders in the Milwaukee community. So with that, I will hand that over back to Catherine for any questions. Thank you. Yes, actually our first question is for you, Magda. It comes from Terry Sater with the WISN 12. He's wondering in regard to the vaccine mandate for city employees, we're hearing there's a high unvaccinated rate in code enforcement as high as 60% could be placed on leave. Can you provide a little more context about that? Uh, we have not drilled down by positions in the Department of Employer Relations as to who is out of compliance or not or in compliance. Uh, what I can say is that uh, the Department of Neighborhood Services has about a 95% compliance rate in their office. And then and that includes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, both individuals who have an approved back, an approved uh, accommodation or who have submitted their vaccination documentation. Thank you, Magda. Our next question is from Terry as well for Commissioner Johnson. He's wondering, in reference to the school vaccination sites, 12 MPS schools and nine, what type are the schools? Sure, the majority are elementary schools and the full list will be um, put out on Thursday so you can see all of the various schools, but the majority are elementary. Okay, um, our next question is from Derica Williams. She's wondering uh, if C the CDC approves today, what is the soonest shots can get into arms here locally? And what does the potential approval mean for full approval ages 12 to 15? So it, the vote will be this afternoon. So in theory, the CDC director could um, green light it as soon as later this evening. Uh, which would mean shots could start going into arms tomorrow. Now, the Wisconsin DHS uh, does review the guidelines as well. And before DHS vaccinators, um, which is local health departments, perhaps uh, Director Rausch or Director Johnson could comment more on that. But I believe local health departments will wait for uh, DHS guidance, which would be anticipated very soon after um, CDC guidance. All right, we're getting the head nods. Great. Um, our next, um, Derek Williams says, and 
part two. Um, so I will follow up on that question. Um, our next few questions come from Allison Durr with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. The first one is, given the presence of the vaccine, what are experts' recommendations for gatherings for the coming holidays? Well, so timing is gonna be key here. So when you think about um, Thanksgiving uh, and you measure out the weeks, you get the first dose, you get the second dose in three weeks, you wait two more weeks for fully vaccinated, um, that's a tight timeline, uh, an unrealistic timeline for Thanksgiving Day. Um, I've looked at the calendar myself as I think about Thanksgiving. Uh, so what you really want to avoid is having unvaccinated people from multiple families together. Um, and so trying to get uh, as many people vaccinated as possible, but certainly not having mixed households of two different unvaccinated groups uh, is what we really want to avoid. So check the calendar, see if you can make it work, um, but uh, it might be tight for uh, an on-time Thanksgiving, if that's what you're looking to do. And Allison's follow-up question is, what should residents expect in terms of how indoor gatherings this year could affect cases, including breakthroughs in the community, given, that vac uh, given the vaccines this year? Uh, I'm not sure I'm completely following the question. I, I think the question is maybe, how should we be looking at holidays this year uh, in a nutshell with breakthrough infections and, and vaccines? So certainly uh, I would say the more people we can get vaccinated, the better. Um, it's exciting to have this five to 11 year old age group able to get vaccinated, able to get another large portion of our population protected um, and in gatherings as well. You know, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier was um, even in elderly populations, you take a 70 year old or an 80 year old uh, who is vaccinated, they just have a higher risk of getting sick with COVID, even if they are vaccinated. The vaccine is extremely important. It decreases their risk substantially, um, but they still have a higher risk of, of adverse effects from COVID than a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old. So you still want to take those extra precautions um, and you still want to make sure as many people in your group uh, are vaccinated. You also want to make sure as many people in your group are generally low risk and trying to be as low risk as they can before a gathering. Uh, our next two questions are from Ubali with TMJ4. I'll ask them one at a time. She's wondering, will parents need to be present while kids are getting shots at any setting, school or clinic? I would say there's a number of opportunities and options for giving vaccines in the community that health departments, pharmacies and other medical providers are, are considering. We are considering doing some school located clinics here in the city of Greenfield, and we're still trying to determine how best to do those. We've deployed a parent survey, but certainly we're aware that a lot of parents will wanna be present. And if we decide to do something without parents present, you know, we'll have to get signatures and approvals beforehand. So that's still kind of up in the, up in the air right now as we continue to wait for the approval and then continue to secure the vaccine and the supplies needed to move forward. And similarly for the city of Milwaukee, we are planning to have our clinics after school. <clears throat> so when parents are likely available to be there with their children, but if parents are unavailable, we are looking and planning on um, a form that can be signed and then sent back to school with a child. Thank you both. Well, the second question is once children five to 11 begin getting vaccinated, can we expect mask mandates in schools to go away? This is a really good question. This is one I talked about a few moments ago in my prepared statements. We have to remember that we are not going to vaccinate everybody with, with the snap of a fingers when it comes to five to 11 year olds. We need to understand it's going to take time to get these kids fully vaccinated. As Dr. Weston mentioned, first dose, three week gap, second dose, two weeks later, then fully vaccinated. And I would continue to encourage school leaders and parents to understand that this is a long road, this is not a short road, and there's no quick fix here. So I would anticipate we will continue to have mask mandates and continue to follow as many of those layered mitigation approaches and strategies as possible for several months. And that may be spring break, and that, or that may, be, look, may look like the end of the school year for this academic year. But I think it will look different down the road. But at this point, I think we need to hold fast for another couple months at least. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. And I think the, the talking points that Darren discussed earlier, the studies 
show that masks are effective in schools. And I think, you know, thinking about them as one layer of protection, vaccines are another layer of protection. They're a critical layer of protection, probably the most important, certainly long term, the most important layer of protection. Um, but they're one. Uh, and if we don't have 100% of kids vaccinated in the schools, which realistically, uh, at this point, we're not going to, masks, distancing, ventilation are going to continue to be critical elements for, for mitigation in schools. And Derricka Williams with Fox 6 is wondering, um, what does this potential approval mean for full approval ages 12 to 15? That was a follow-up question to um, the, the CDC meeting today. Well, I think we'll see cascades as we go along. So we saw uh, once adults had been getting the vaccine for a while, the full approval there. I think uh, in the future, we'll see the full approval for uh, 12 to 15 year olds, and then following that, the full approval for five to 11 year olds. But uh, I think the take home point is that the trials, the experiments, uh, that is done. Uh, and that's why the FDA authorizes these vaccines because they've been given in a testing capacity, in an experimental capacity. They've been given to thousands of people who were willing to step forward and put themselves out there and, and see if these vaccines were as effective as we thought they were. Uh, and it turns out they are. They're as effective as we thought they were, and they're uh, even safer than we could ever have anticipated. So uh, the experiments, the trials are over. These will be, uh, I think, later today. Uh, these will be, or, or potentially tomorrow, uh, these will be uh, green-lighted, fully authorized um, vaccines so people can feel, feel comfortable giving them. But I think full approval will follow in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Weston. Those appear to be all of the questions in the chat for today. So thank you all for joining us and we will see you next week.